thank you everyone for coming to join us today. First of all, I would like to, to thank Catapult Crown Education for this pretty good initiative. So we are able to share among uh, the colleagues uh, a very nice hot topic, actually. And I just follow uh, Catapult Education also on Instagram. I'm very excited to be here today. Almost I'm from Brazil and I'm so uh, proud to be share some thoughts and some innovations on perimplantites. I put just a title, a very short title, a clinical update, because nowadays perimplantitis is a hot topic, it's a burden disease that everybody that's work in, period, in periodontics and in our implantology field as aware in how tough is to treat perimplantites. And sometimes as a clinician, uh, I prefer to not found perimplantites even to treat perimplantites as is a really uh, uh, hard to treat and to overcome those disease. And as uh, uh, Lisa mentioned, I would like to uh, introduce uh, my group because uh, more important than myself is to present my group, almost some data I will share with you coming from my university, I'm from Brazil, my faculty, I'm head and director of my department of our implantology here in Brazil. Our, our implantology is a discipline, is a specialty as a periodontics and orthodontics, our maxillofacial and, and US and Israel and Europe. Here in Brazil, our implantology is a discipline. So this is my group of PhD specialists and master students. And I would like to acknowledge them from their hard job to do that. Having said that, let's go to talk about how often we found perimplantites in cases like that, because almost the time everybody shows or share some very nice cases like that. And we all have nice papilla, nice pink and white aesthetic, the crown, the emergence profile of the soft tissue, everything ready. And as you can see, two years follow up. However, after seven years follow up, we see uh, probing depth more than seven millimeter. We have tooth, we have inflammation, and we go through to this defect we have with this huge defect. Of course, together with the infection, we have a lot of uh, clinical, local, and systemic situation that could jeopardize the long-term follow-up of the dental implants. However, we must, uh, take in mind that what happened with this case? Why we should uh, present or should detect perimplantites in our patients? First of all, I would like to point out that perimplantite is not related with a kind of brand of implants, at least until now. It's not related with, you know, sometimes we have some predictability coming from some uh, professionals that not aware to how to treat the patient, but perimplantites it will happen in almost at least four to ten percent of all your case. That means if in US, in Brazil, just an idea in 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 2020 before the pandemic uh, era, where uh, US and Brazil uh, uh, sold more than. 10 million implant. That means 10%, let's just to, to be easy to reach the number, 10% is almost 1 million implant will become diseased after at least five years. This is a huge number to treat. And almost when we talk about complications and how we define complication as unfavorable result of disease, health condition of even treatment, those complications may affect the prognosis and also the outcome of the disease. This is a good point because uh, it's also important to define in a right way what means perimplantite, what means bone loss, what means inflammation, what is mucosite, because we must detect and define the disease that we will treat or we, we will detect, this is important. Because otherwise, I will start to talk, I have a case of perimplantites here in Brazil, and my friends in Israel, I have perimplantites, in US I have perimplantites, and almost 
And sometimes these cases are, we do not have a match between really perimplantitis and really bone loss and really other diseases that are not related with perimplantitis. At the end, all those clinical situations will be in a bad shape result that could jeopardize the long-term follow-up. And this is important when you can see on a big picture like that, where we can call the, the picture of our nightmares. All these pictures show a failure or, or an implant that an ailing implant that we will try to treat or even will check what kind of complication we have. And we must also uh, have in mind that the patient, our patient in our office, will pay not only to put and to place the implant and also the crowns and the restorative procedure, but also to keep the implant on the road. That means you have the compliance, their own compliance, and also on, on a program to keep those implants at least healthy in that kind. But when we have the complications in our implantology, in a didactic, po in academic point of view, in the clinical point of view also, why not? We split those cases in technical and mechanical. That means that we have the, pro uh, the problem with the implant supported restoration, or we have biological problems. That's the worst part of uh, the cases because in biological problems, we have uh, the problems between the placement or even after or before the loading. When we have before the loading, almost the cases are related with the loss of os integrations. It's before to go to the implant support restoration phases. That means we are uh, before to treat the implant and everything else. However, when we have this after, we can uh, divide this in bone loss, perimplant disease, and also in implant failure. And when we are talking about bone loss, about perimplantites, and about implant failure, it's important also to check in how we will uh, treat all those clinical cases. And imagine when I start to study uh, perimplantites in my master's degree, when I, I just finished my, my grad in 1996, uh, believe me or not, Maybe some cases we are not believing perimplantites. We are talking about saucerization, about bone loss remodulation, or talking about biological width, about external, internal X, Mars pepper, and this. But now, actually, in 2023, we knew about how we can keep the alveolar bone loss or the perimplant bone surrounding the implant in a health situation. This is a good point because otherwise we will have those clinical pictures as you can see in our screen from left to the right. And when we have the bone loss and maybe sometimes bone loss are not related with inflammation or infection. Why? Because sometimes are related with uh, occlusion overload or even a biological with Professor Karmish since ends of 90s, uh, we're talking about occlusion overloading and adapt bone adaptation according to implant support restoration. This is not the forum for today to this discussion. However, we must keep this uh, under our umbrella when we start to treat the patient and check also all the kind of the restoration. Uh, from left, this middle, we have this uh, clinical picture. It's uh, really a nightmare. I don't know it's worst when you have the bone loss and the implant is still on, on the place or when you have uh, extraction of the implant. This is the end. It's like when we have the tooth loss. This is a big deal when we have uh, implant support restoration. Even is the same Brazil in the last two decades, we have a grow on the... On the, on the age of the population. And so when we talk about age population, we are growing also with some systemic disease like US, diabetes, osteoporosis, and more some local complications. We are not talking about only um, uh, soft tissue phenotype, but also some local complications as kind of uh, implant abutment connection, implant surface topography, 
and so uh, some clinical data. But let's uh, came back to our focus of talk about perimplantites just to define to our friends and attendees today, our colleagues, how to define all these kinds of things. When we are talking about bone loss, we must defer bone remodeling biological width from the bone loss because uh, in 80s, end of 80s, uh, early 90s, according to Albrechtson, it's really normal to find out uh, some bone remodulation around external X. This is uh, where this was the definition from almost the last 40 years, what will happen with the external X when you have this activation on that. Second of all, when we talk about overloading and inclusion trauma, we, ha was, we have not a periodontal ligament around the implant. The imbalance about the occlusion overloading, we could uh, achieve adaptive tissue resorption or bone loss. And I could just uh, point out this, the blue uh, references are mentioned is coming from uh, my group. And so we are working on that since 2000, 1999, 2000, working on that, on the field and perimplantites. And we are trying to figure it out, each clinical point, each clinical feature, each clinical uh, factor that could impact or in, in positive or negative way to treat implants. And finally, the uh, medicamentation resorption, osteonecrosis of the jaws, that this is, is you, we have a huge increase of the incidence of these cases in Brazil. And I'm sure that uh, uh, you guys in US or even in Europe and Israel are uh, facing the same cases. And almost our patients that more need implant, the patients in the 60 or 70, especially the female group when used from the treatment of osteoporosis or even patients that suffer uh, chemotherapy to treat some oncologic problem have some uh, great or uh, good impact on this uh, resorption, almost the alendronate or bifosphonate on that. And you must also have that. And we have perimplantites. It's good to define perimplantites. Uh, almost what we have in our teeth, we have periodontites and gingivites. In dental implants, we have perimplantites and mucosites. And according to the last uh, American European Academy uh, workshop perio in 2018, perimplantites is a plaque associate pathologic condition when we have a bone resorption that's in an irreversible way. Instead, we have mucosites, an inflammatory lesion of the soft tissue surrounding the implant in absence of loss of supporting bone. And both conditions can, uh, mucosites we are, is reversible. We can uh, treat these cases or changing the implant support restoration or giving uh, the first aid to, to the patient, uh, the treatment, oral hygiene instruction. But if the mucosite is not treated, we can reach the perimplantites. This is an important point to treat. And again, perimplantites is not related to specific implant surface, is not specific to a, uh, a specific implant abutment connection, but is a multifactorial disease that we can took is like on a bullet point. This we must to check out is the implant surface topography, the implant abutment connection and everything else. This is uh, very important on that. And as to see, uh, we can see that a perimplantites is, is presented by almost in a similar way, the same pathologic periodontal bacteria that we are presented in periodontal disease. This is a paper to publish in 2008 in clinical oral implant research. And the main target of the treatment of perimplantite is to solve the inflammation and avoid the further perimplant bone losses like a case is perimplantites and after nine year treatment. And this is important also to check in because in the last uh, decade, some studies, some studies, and also some research, specifically from Sweden, start to talk about foreign by reaction and not specific to play control. Guys, listen, until today, September 13, 
2023, perimplantite is a plague bacterial condition associated. But we start to talk about who, who came first, the chicken or the egg, where we have the titanium particles surrounding the soft tissues when we have perimplantites is almost because when you have the infection, we have a, a down pH in acid environment that could release some titanium particles. It is true that titanium particles could be toxic from the surrounding tissue and could increase and to start the reaction, including osteoclastogenic factors to loss perimplant bone. This is true. However, it's important that this will happen after infection, not to have the release of uh, titanium particles to before to after have this infection. This is, is an important point because when we know the etiology of the disease, we are able to treat the disease. This is almost obvious, but I learned in my academic point of view that sometimes everything should be not so obvious like that. And so it's important to have clear here with our audience that perimplantite, it's a bacterial pl plague, it's a plague bacterial bio dental biofilm induced disease. This is important to see. And however, before we go through to our topic, we must point that out that we will treat or we will remove the implant because nowadays some of the cases that we uh, find in our clinical practice, daily clinical practice, we are not able to treat according to uh, the actual, the contemporary knowledge about treatment of perimplantites, even using surgical tips. This is important to know, even using laser, prophylaxis, whatever, antibiotics or not, we just published a paper in clinical implant density related research together with Professor Magda Ferris from, from uh, Harvard School of Dental Medicine. She is the new chair of the Perry department. And we published together with her talking that antibiotics in some cases should be good. However, it's important to see the extension and severity of the treatment and which kind of treatment we will employ, we will use to treat those diseases. This is an important point as every disease, if, and let's talk about periodontal treatment. You must know the grade, the stage. So we will define the, uh, edit your, the, the treatment plan and the diagnosis of your disease. The same here. Coming back to the, our implants. So we will decide to treat or to remove the implant. So I just have uh, four points in objective way. So when we have mobility, fractured implant or misplaced implant, we will remove them. We are not treat anymore. And even with after the release of the retriever uh, screw, that is more easy to retrieve implant without the trephine. So we can reach uh, less bone loss. This is a good point. The second one in short implants, less than eight millimeter, or when you have bone defect higher than 50% of the half of the length of the implant, we are not able to treat anyway. This implant we will replace them. And some implants are coated surface, hydroxypatite. I'm not sure that even in US or in Europe are uh, some company or brand that sell uh, implants coated with hydroxypatite, but anyway, I'm not sure that, but hydroxypatite is more prone as a TPS and a diesel surface. Those surfaces are more prone to have perimplantites and therefore we are not able to treat them. And finally, the size and the shape of the defect. Implants placed too close to the teeth for all three implants, we should remove them. And uh, in the uh, workshop of 2018, uh, a paper from uh, Hammer, uh, Christopher Hammer from uh, uh, Zurich and uh, Dennis Tarno from Columbia, New York, both got the, the guys, this paper published by just two uh, giants of the, the periodontology, just mentioned those cases, it's very important to see. However, the defect also, the morphology of the defect when we are talking, especially in the regenerative ways is important because three to four walls are more prone 
to have more regeneration when compared with two and one walls. This is obvious. We are coming from a peri treatment, and this is in biological point of way is almost obvious. However, in the defect of four walls, we almost are able to treat only with scaling, with planing, laser, for gel prophylaxis. You can put some kinds. We can uh, boost our graft using PDGF or BMP, if you are PRF, whatever you want, depending on your school, are you are able to do it? This is, this is pretty good. And when we go back to our slide, it's important also to see cases like that. Because when we go to how the strategies uh, to treat perimplantites, we have almost two main strategies. First of all, is about to anti-infective. When you use about mechanical or physical debridement, mechanical is more useful in most common all the clinical office like curate, like uh, ultrasonic device or something like that. You can use Teflon metallic Jamil. We have a, a, leg, a legend that we are not able to to use uh, scaling and implant uh, planning using. Uh, metallic curates, but sometimes all the our curates are metallic. Jamil Teflon uh, doesn't work. Yes, doesn't scratch the surface, but doesn't clean it neither. I mean, didn't work. But in, in ultrasonic device, the Teflon types work very nice. And the laser and high power laser using Erbuchromum Etrin Scanium Gallium Garnier or Erbuyard is also pretty good and also anti, uh, antimicrobial photodynamic therapy. However, we must not confuse or use uh, a mix it up, a high power laser with uh, antimicrobial photodynamic therapy are completely different treatment. They almost, although the strategies are almost the same to reduce the bacterial plague. However, we are able to vaporize using Erbriag and Erbichromo uh, instead the antimicrobial for dynamic therapy, you are able to modulate this biofilm. So we need also to remove in mechanical way. Now using a chemical or local and systemic antimicro antimicrobials like chlorexidine, minocycline, metronidazole. We just, as I saw, be as I saw before, uh, I said before, we just published a paper on, on clinical plant density related research, showing that is not. Some, we must decide before the kind of treatment to use that. In, in guide bone regeneration, reconstructive, reconstructive uh, way, we need to infra bone or decency of brain plant defect. However, until now we have no consensus about which the best membrane and have a very nice implant. It's an old paper, however, published by uh, Professor Klaus Lang and, and colleagues in 1997 in analysis of periodontology showing that depending of the station and the severity of the perimplantites, we should sometimes also to remove the implant. And this is until now is very useful to treat. And almost to when we are treating perimplantites, some highlights should be placed on as about a surgical, both anti-infective and relatively not surgical, long-term follow-up, and also forcible how to treat all this. When you're talking about surgical treatment, sometimes the clinician, uh, some thoughts, some clinician, some thoughts are, no, no, surgical is much better. Depends. Depends how the stension, the, uh, the uh, sub-tissue phenotype, the gingiva, the perimplant sub-tissue phenotype, are the thing, and the access. Sometimes we are not able to remove the implant support restoration. For example, in cemented case, different and screw assessed uh, restoration that you are able to remove and to place again those implants. This is important. This is a systematic review published by uh, Koshkan and coming from uh, Michigan group. This is, was uh, leader, leader by Professor Howley Wang. He is actually the president of Academy of Osseous Integration. And this is a very nice paper. And he showed that the mean of bone fill almost 2.17 millimeter and the probing depth reduction is not more than three millimeter. This is important because I will start to show some data about the treatment. It's also nice to see that 
uh, we have no clinical evidence that reconstructive or not reconstructive procedures are more uh, important or more feasible than one each other. This is important to see. And this is a paper uh, my group published in 2018. After two years treatment, we decide to see if uh, toothpaste containing uh, triclosan is, much, is better against the fluoride uh, toothpaste. So what we decide, we use uh, to evaluate, oops, sorry, I just to go back on the slide. And so we use a surgical approach. We just open a flap, raise a flap, debride all the implant using prophylaxis uh, po jet power and correct to remove uh, tissue granulation and everything else. And after we just uh, suture close the flap without a graft without membrane, without biomaterial, without an only anti-infective treatment. So we go, uh, we uh, uh, start from the beginning. So the perimplantitis infection, we must remove the infection to therefore reach a clinical uh, health situation to thereafter treat that. I'm not saying this is the best or not the way, but this is a study. So to show uh, to you guys today. And so we see that uh, triclosan, which was much better than fluoride, but even when you go look and closer to, da to data in your left side of your screen, you can see in the both cases, under uh, extreme, extreme compliance, both groups were pretty good. We are have not loss of uh, clinical attachment on that. And the important point was that after one year and a half, two years, we have no less than 1% of uh, uh, period, uh, per implant pocket death higher or equal than six millimeter. And even war, uh, in uh, worst probing death higher or equal or seven millimeter, we have, if we combine both of group, less than 0.5%. That means the treatment to remove the infection in the patient is in close compliance even the microbiological control in the red group and the bad guys were our lo lower. And we conclude that perimplantite treatment using uh, triclosan with gun trace to using the control were effective on the street uh, maintenance program. However, I must uh, tell you guys that in US, I don't, I'm not sure about Europe, but Colgate Palmolive just removed the triclos and grand trace from the market. Uh, I'm sure that the US is not almost allowed to sell that and is out, but now have some uh, different components that you can use on that. Having said that, another uh, study performed by my two former PhD students, Bruno Melo and Rafael Shiroma, we just collect uh, cases that we treat 10 to 15 years using uh, follow-up and we uh, debride using the toxification, the surface with citric acid, as mentioned by Holland Meffer, since 1993, in, in a paper published in, in uh, Implant Dental, almost 30 years ago, and we use mitronidazole and amoxicillin using xenograft material. This is a clinical case. As you can see here, after six months, we have a good bone loss. However, when we follow those patients almost 15 years, we saw that we have almost lost all this bone because we, as a suggestion, we can extrapolate that this bone filling doesn't mean re integration. Why? Because we are not able to clean it up all this implant surface topography that are allow the new bone attach again to the implant or as called re integration re integration is a, a new os integration process in a previously contaminated implant surface. And our result that uh, seven implants were removed from four patients and 10 out 89 implants is still showing go ongoing bone loss after 15 years. So we have a survival rate are, are around 80%. And I would to stress this point, Probing depth reduction was around 3.5 millimeters. It's pretty close that the paper published by Hal Lake and colleagues from Michigan. 
And however, smoking, history of periodontides and morphology also jeopardize of that. And we start to use laser in the same way. Again, uh, instead to use acid, acid, uh, uh, citric, acid, citric acid, we use a laser to use that. And we divide 60 subjects in four groups to use defects like that. As you can see using the laser, laser is very useful too. It's expensive, but very useful too, it's to it's clean up it's everything, it's the surface. And nine years follow up using a graft is everything is pretty good. As you can see here, we have almost achieved 92% of the subjects achieve the clinical endpoint that least. That means after one year, the per I do not have per implant uh, bone sites with more than five millimeter probing depth, bleeding on probing and all separation. So, oops, sorry, I just be back that. And we conclude that yes, Airbnb, yes, but this is also depend on the morphology of the bone defect. When we go back our previous slide, when we just pointed out some highlights, we have here the surgical and now the non-surgical therapy. Non-surgical therapy sometimes are not useful to treat completely perimplantites. However, some new improvement and using new technologies, as I will show you uh, later, are very impressive. And one of the papers I will show you are more very impressive with those data because non-surgical therapy is almost important to go previously to the surgical therapy. So you can, you know, reduce the acute phase of the inflammation to chronify this lesion and thereafter to use the treatment. And this is a, a good uh, approach to use that. In a systematic review published by Clovis Fajon, Clovis is a Brazilian guy that lives in, in Germany in almost 20 years. It was a very nice paper showing that almost uh, non-surgical therapy using only debridement, mechanical debridement, was not allowed to clean it up efficiently all this, the implant surface. So that means that together with the mechanical debridement, you almost must use or chlorhexidine or photodynamic therapy or systemic or uh, local antibiotics, air abrasive, vector, whatever you want. You must, you know, you must increase the power or your debridement to treat that. And so he concluded that the current evidence, this is 10 years ago, but is still active. It does not conclusively show that any particular non-surgical treatment for perimplantites perform better than the bridement alone. I will also talk about this paper after to show the very nice study that we have. This is a paper from my, my former students. I always show uh, the my PhD students, the clinician. This is Dr. Daniel Ferrari and Dr. Rafael Shiroma. Rafael will still work uh, with us. He's just finalizing his uh, PhD student, PhD uh, program. Maybe in the uh, end of this year or beginning of the next year, he's uh, finalizing his uh, study. But this study we published in 2019, we use uh, uh, amoxicillin and mitronidazole to treat perimplantites. And this is very nice topic because everybody know, asked me, Jamil, why you use metronidazole and uh, amoxicillin? Because we used to treat the former aggressive periodontites, that mean uh, grade C and D, stage three and four. We use uh, some antibiotics to change, the, to modify as a climax community to change this uh, climate community, to change this environment to pathogenic bacteria so we can uh, kill the bad guys and improve uh, a nice environment of the good ones. And so we, we treat the perimplantites. And I just forgot to mention all the perimplantite defects were severe defects. This is important. Also probing depth higher or equal than five millimeters, bleeding on probing, uh, bone loss, everything, and we uh, divide uh, those patients, 40 patients, in two groups. North surgical debridement using uh, Teflon curates plus placebo control, and the test group that we use 
uh, no surgical debridement using uh, Teflon, but we uh, use also metronidazole and amoxicillin. And the compliance, we just do a supragingival maintenance uh, play control at uh, three at zero baseline, three, six, and 12 months until reach one year. What you can see here, this is a clinical picture just to show you how well that's using uh, baseline and uh, one year follow-up. And you can see that uh, both, group, both groups achieve the clinical endpoint. We have a difference between uh, the delta about the probing depth when it, uh, at baseline in 12 months is 1.8 from the control group and more than three millimeters from the test group. However, almost the groups are uh, more than 55% of the group reach uh, the clinical, achieve the clinical endpoint. The clinical endpoint for pre-implantites defined by a paper published by Lisa Mansfield in Andrea Mombelli and International Journal of Maxillofacial Implants this is since 2014 and ratified by the workshop that we, after the treatment of perimplantites, we are not able to have a probing depth higher than five millimeters, uh, absence of bleeding or probing, and also no foot or bone loss or if neither separation. And when you see that 55 against 65, that means uh, we are not able to provide and to use antibiotics to the patient so you can uh, use antibiotics just to you know almost in some case of perimplantitis we have local uh, disease and not systemic disease disease and in the last year several papers are showing that periodontitis are completely different disease from in disease point of view for perimplantitis instead both present some clinical features as uh, probing death, bleeding on probing, separation, and bone loss. The etiopathology and the uh, etiophysiology of this soft tissue, for example, we have no uh, periodontal ligament around the implant or something like that. We are not able to equalize all the, all those treatment. And as conclusion, adjunctive use of mitronidazole and oxidina do not present nice, uh, achieve nice results after one year compared to control group. The second treatment that we perform here in my university, we perform the famous implantoplasty. Nowadays is is fancy treatment, but sometimes uh, uh, the patient are asked about how to treat and how you scratch out the implant surface with the burr and something like that, but sometimes work. This is was... Uh, the PhD thesis of uh, Bruno Melo and Waterson Prado work together on a compliance after three to 10 years follow-up. And this is a case in implant of 3.75, 16 millimeter length. This implant I placed a long time ago because the guys teach me to place uh, as longer implant is better. And nowadays we, we know that this is not a need to do that. And we use the burrs to clean it up and to remove all the screws of the, the threads of the implant, you, as you can see. And after eight years, we have creeping attachment and so those data. There we have a reduction of probing depth and again, of clinical attachment level. However, when we, you remove the threads of the dental implant, the screw face, uh, you uh, almost uh, have some uh, fracture implant because you decrease the resistance, the mechanical resistance of the implant. However, we achieve an, a clinical endpoint of 71%. And finally, I'm, I'm going to, to show some really new data. This is uh, amazing data just published in, uh, in August, in last August, that a group from Israel coming from Hamdam University from Professor Meyer and his colleagues. The guy's using a new uh, med device, a miniature a specialized device that is uh, like a healing abutment that the guys use a uh, pulsed electromagnetic field uh, acting as a disjunctive to treat perimplantitis using a non-surgical therapy. This is, was very nice because the guys use 
in from your left side in your uh, screen. The guys use this device that works as a healing abutment, exactly heal abutment. The guy, uh, the company has some healing abutments from several brands in connection to implants. These abutments are activated and this abutment uh, generates some pulse that allow that we are able to modulate the micro environment surrounding the implant. So we can reduce, as you can see in this upper uh, right uh, side, this picture, we have less bacteria uh, against the control. So uh, the guys using a tips and uh, ultrasonic devices in tips to clean it up uh, surrounding the implant surface topography using uh teflon tips and where the guys remove the crown of the implant and put as you can see one month the healing abutment inside and after that the guys check the probing depth in that probing depth and the bone gain but jamil how works this pulse around the soft tissue i never heard about that use the pulse is not new almost in orthopedic field to uh increase the healing of long uh, bone fractures as tibia and nuna, the guys can use this. The uh, the idea, the novelty of the, that, the guys miniaturize uh, 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 something like uh, uh, one millimeter square. I'm not sure about in inches, uh, this, this size, but this is like a, a big boxer. The guys miniaturize from a size like that using a healing abutment. And this healing abutment, uh, in, uh, are able to produce a pulse that are able to modulate this biofilm. This is a paper published by our group in 2020 in an important journal of uh, microbiology called biofoling. And when we uh, we decrease the, uh, the viral uh, bacterial load in almost 60% compared with the control one, the control group, and so after we treat, instead to use chlorhexidine or antibiotics, you put the healing abutment in an open, uh, without open a flap, just the debridement. And this pulse will modulate, will decrease the number of pathogenic bacteria in this, um, in this in inflammation situation. And we'll, cre we'll create, we'll generate a new environment to allow and to facilitate the regrowth of the bone. This is, is really amazing. I'm really excited with this, uh, this technology. And they got this paper, our paper showed that the mean of total bacteria counts were lower in test group and the effects, the antimicrobial, antimicrobial effects of those bacterial species can be used to control the bacterial colonization. Based on that data, the guys from Israel go into the, the paper from uh, Dr. Meyer from Hamdam uh, University, show that this data we provide, we have more uh, bone gain, have more bone loss, and also we decrease the probing pocket depth. This is pretty, this is amazing, you know? This is really a novelty. This is increase the capability to the clinician and not only the clinician, but also the periodontist and also oral surgeon to treat perimplantites in uh, in their office in not in an easy way because sometimes uh, the word easy means oh this is uh, useful, but it is useful, but it's not easy. But you need also use the mechanical debridement in closed flap. You don't need to raise a flap using ultra ultra sound device or something like that. And also an important. I think that an uh, important feature from this paper and that the guys increase uh, the interleukin beta and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the rich interleu uh, higher concentration in interleukin beta is an important chemotherapy surrounding the uh, inflammation are completely decreased after one month. Just only guys without antibiotics, without only for the pulse. And this is very nice. And when we go to the literature and compare papers from Eli Marte, 2021, Hatenar, 2021, The Wall, Merli, 
Stephanie Fresco, my group, Shibli, when you compare with the group of Meyer, we can see that this group, uh, uh, the, uh, the paper produced for Meyer using the pools reach almost a nice clinical outcomes compared with use the antibiotics. Imagine that you do not read, not need prescri prescribe antibiotics to your patients and only with this uh, a pulse you can do. However, of course, this is uh, preliminary data as the guys show on their paper. I'm very excited on that, as you can see here, comparing the other groups. And if we go to uh, 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 highlights, this is important because I imagining, I'm wondering if this are we are able to use to treat uh, non uh, non uh, using non surgical therapy as uh, as a first of all a long term follow up. This is a paper published by a very no uh, group from Gothenburg that almost forty percent of the implant that suffer surgical treatment of perimplantites present recurrency of progression of the infection after treatment. Guys, 50% of the implants will, became, will become diseased after surgical treatment. Imagine if after the treatment, if you have some problem, we started with mucosite, we just can, you can only remove the crown and replace by... Uh, an abatement, a healing abatement that will provide this push and control the implant, of course, together with mechanical debridement. So as I go into the, uh, finalize my, my conference today, as conclusion remarks, mechanical non-surgical pulsed electromagnetic field therapy improved the clinical uh, outcomes, uh, at least for mild to severe perimplantites, Surgical therapy using both anti-infective or anti-infective plus regenerative procedures improve clinical outcomes. However, none of the treatments resulted into total resolution of the disease. And finally, supportive therapy care and compliance are sine qua non to improve clinical outcomes. I, I'm wondering if I can use also those healing abatements to improve my supportive therapy. So. I wanna thank you, your time. I wanna thank you, Catapult Crown Education for the opportunity, opportunity to share my thoughts and my experience to treat perimplantites and this opportunity to show all the studies that we are producing here in Brazil to all the world and also Mike Dent for the, the opportunity to work with them. So thank you very much, am I here? To, yeah, I will go to the chat and the key A to answer your questions. Oh, have I have a nice question here from Dr. Nora that asked me about what are the some recommendations to prevent perimplantites during the implant surgery? And during, okay, yeah, this all, these are two questions. Okay, during the implant surgery, follow all the, the surgical uh, protocol and also all the treatment planning. I mean, bone graft, uh, gingival phenotype, 3D position of the implant. These are important tools, especially uh, avoid the facial bone. This is important. And during the perimentancy, this is important. As you can see, you can uh, provide from uh, to the our uh, patient technology about uh, his implant support restoration. Our patients, when he knows more information, but information with quality and precision, uh, more efficient will become his compliance and more efficient will become the uh, long-term follow-up. It's like a, a therapy, a periodontal uh, therapy of uh, support or support periodontal therapy, you can use almost in the same way. And the funny thing that we are in 2023, we do not have specifically uh, periodontal support therapy to implants as, uh, for example, uh, Thomas Wilson Jr. published 20 years ago. I mean, if the guys are a smoker, have diabetes, has uh, 
uh, history of periodontitis, the patient should uh, stay in our office almost every three months, every six months. But we are using the same idea to do that. This is this is uh, 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 almost uh, important to do that. And let me see in the chat, if I'm in the chat. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. I go in, hello, this is from Houston. What, uh, Dr. Naga, some recommendation. Okay. Priyanka, thank, thank you for your presentation. When we can see a patient has severe chronic periodontitis with their natural teeth, what are recommendation with placing implants in these patients? One that they just get per implants around the implants like they got per around their teeth. Yes, you're completely right. That's why we must treat the periodontites before we go through to, to the place the implant. Joseph, do you recommend the use of laser specific to treat periodontites? Like, yes, I can use that. Like, I, I agree with you. Uh, nowadays, we have a uh, plenty of, uh, of uh, treatments using lasers. Uh, we have a specific Erbichromo, Erbiag. We have CO2 are coming back to the market. And I, I uh, we can use a specific one. I have here specifically my in my my personal experiences use Erbiag and Erbichromo on that. And it works well to regenerative treatment and also to non-surgical treatment. And AB asked me, can you place an implant on someone who smokes? Yes. Of course we can do, but those patients are uh, present a risk factor. The patients, the smoker patients are more prone to present perimplantites. Those guys present an odds ratio is around, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's eight or 16 uh, times more prone to have perimplantites compared to non-smokers. Uh, James Sagawa, do these implants have a family? Oh, the same one. This is a periodontal where is their dentition? Yes, almost. It's this is funny because uh, we are clinicians. Uh, almost the time that the patient that more needs implant need because they here uh, lost their teeth will need implants are the patients with periodontitis and patient smokers and diabetes and those patients will uh, present an odds ratio at least eight times more to have perimplantites compared to the, to the healthy uh, patients. This is an important point. Thanks for questions. 